Good morning, you wonderful people. Today we're going to be talking about the path that the U.S. economy has taken over the past year. We're going to first be talking about the recession that happened at the beginning of the year because of the coronavirus. And then we're going to be talking about this thing called a K-shaped recovery. And what is a K-shaped recovery? And finally, we're going to talk about how has this K-shaped recovery affected different people in the U.S. and different parts of the economy. So, first, let's talk about the recession that happened earlier in this year caused by the coronavirus. So, what is a recession? A recession is... Basically, when the U.S. produces less and less stuff for two straight quarters, so for six months. And when I say produces less stuff, we're talking about producing less items and less services. Here, items is talking about producing less planes, less cars, physical things. Here, where they're talking about pr producing less services, services is when you do something for somebody, but you don't make something physical for them. So, for example, a service is if you go get your oil changed or your car fixed at a mechanic, the mechanic fixes your car. He uses his body to fix the car but he didn't make something new for you. He didn't make a new item for you. So if you add up the value of all the items and all the services that the economy produces, if that number goes down for two quarters, then we call that a recession. Here, this word right here, gross domestic product, is just the value in dollars of everything that the U.S. makes, produces, or its services for one year. And as you notice, the y-axis here is the value of those goods and services in billions of dollars. And your x-axis here is talking about time. So right here, this would be about the middle of 2017. So from then all the way through the first quarter of 2020, the economy was growing. We were producing more things. We were producing more valuable things here in the U.S. Since then, though, this very first quarter, from here to here, this is talking about January, February, and March of 2020. And in January and February, the economy was actually still growing, but March went down fast enough it pulled the whole three month period down. So in that very first quarter, if you're looking at all three months combined, the US actually produced less at the end of March compared to the beginning of January. So that is the first quarter it went down. And then this next quarter right here is quarter two of 2020. And that includes April, May, and June. And that went down by a lot. So officially, the recession we're currently in started in the first quarter of 2020. <clears throat> so the recession or the official month where the recession started uh, here in the U.S., people uh, generally agree it was in February where we started producing less. 
the last time that we had a recession was in 2009. Our last recession happened from 2007 to 2009. This recession started in February of 2020. And recessions are pretty common, actually. So the economy goes through a cycle where it grows and then it shrinks. It'll, it'll grow and then there'll be a recession. And a recession here in the US happens on average every seven to nine years, about that much. So this is actually this 11 year difference between these two. That's one of the longest periods of time where we, we've gone through without a recession. So, um, this recession that started in February 2020, if you are looking from March until September, the U.S. lost about 62 million jobs, or 62 million people lost their jobs. The U.S. has about 360 million people in total. That counts old people, young people, people who were just born. So 62 million out of 360 million means about 20% of everybody in the U.S. lost their job in this six-month period between March and September. Now, obviously, of the 360 million people in the U.S., not everybody had a job before March. But if we're looking at just the people who had a job in February, and we take away 62 million of those jobs, that is 40% of all those jobs. So... Another way of thinking about this is that 40% of everybody who had a job in February lost their job sometime between March and September. Now, for some of those people, they have found a different job since then, but 40% of everybody who had a job in February, has lost it um, from March through September. Here in the U.S., when you lose your job, and it's not your fault that you lost a job, many times you can file for unemployment insurance. And this is the government giving you some money while you look for another job. This graph right here is how many people filed for unemployment insurance on any given week. The y-axis right here is in thousands. So this is 2,000,000 ,000 or 2 million, 4,000,000, ,000 or 4 million, 6 million, 8 million. And down here, we're talking about time on the x-axis. So before the recession, over here in you know February, January, this right here is about how many people would lose their jobs every week and file for unemployment insurance. It was down in the about 200,000 to 250,000 people would lose a job every week. And that spiked. This right here is about 3 million. This right here was the very height of it. This right here is about 7 million people in just one week losing their job and asking for unemployment insurance. 
this is a lot higher than basically ever before. So if you're looking at before this pandemic, if you're looking at before March, the highest ever was 866,000 people filed for unemployment insurance in one week. This is 3 million. So about three to four times bigger than ever before in the whole US history. We're now down here at about 1 million still higher than ever before in US history. So this period of time that we've just lived through is the fastest that people have ever lost their job ever in US history. This word right here, unemployment rate, is the number of people who either, the number or percent of people who want a job but can't find one. Before the recession in February 2020, the unemployment rate was about 3.5, 3.6% for the previous year. So last year, 2019, it was about this for the whole year. Now, with this many people losing their job, you have a lot more people without job, without a job. By March, the unemployment rate had gone up about 1% to 4.4%. And then once this hit, it pushed the unemployment rate all the way up to 14.7% in April. And this is probably the highest unemployment rate the U.S. has seen since the 1920s, 1930s. So here you see the unemployment rate. And like I was saying, for most of 2019, Unemployment rate was 3.5, 3.6%. And then it has gone up a lot since then. And the unemployment rate has been going down ever since April. But even now, the unemployment rate is still at about 8.4%, which is more than double what it was before the recession. So we just finished talking about the recession, when the economy produces less and less things. So therefore, companies fire people because they don't need as many people if you're going to produce less. And after every single recession, there is a recovery. A recovery is just when the U.S. produces more and more stuff after a recession. And how quickly the economy recovers, how quickly the economy goes back up, people like to talk about different shapes to the recovery. Here, this is called in a V-shape recovery. The economy goes down very quickly and then goes back up very quickly. This is what the recession of 1953 looked like. And if, if you just draw the letter on top of this recovery, I think everyone could see why they call it a V-shaped recovery. So the economy goes down very quickly, goes back up very quickly. Now, another type of shape that they like to put on to recoveries, they call it a U-shaped recovery. 
Now, this is not exactly a U, but like a U, it went down. And then you have this bottom part where it sort of goes like that. And then it goes back up. So not exactly a perfect U because this is real life data. This is what happened in real life. And it doesn't quite fit a U, but I think you can sort of see why they would call this a U-shaped recovery. And this is what the recession in 1973 to 1975 looked like. Here is these two recoveries here, the V-shaped in 1953 and the U-shaped in 1973. This is talking about the U.S. Here is an example from India. This is the India stock market. And this blue line right here, somebody drew it. So they're just showing you that, yeah, it sort of went down like this and then back up like that. So for this person, they're looking at it and saying, this looks to them like a U-shaped recovery. Okay. The next letter that people like to talk about is the W-shaped recovery. And here the economy goes down, it goes back up, and people think it has fully recovered, and then it goes back down again before it finally goes up. So in a W-shaped recovery, you sort of have two recessions and then two recoveries. And this happened in the early 80s here in the United States. So at the very beginning of this video, I told you we were going to be talking about a K-shaped recovery. Now, how can you have a K-shaped? It doesn't quite fit on something like this. Well, a K-shaped recovery is when you have one group that recovers very quickly and then you have one group that stays down in the recession or takes a lot longer to recover. So this right here is what they mean by the K-shaped recovery. In this particular recovery that we are in, there are some groups that are recovering very quickly and some groups that are recovering very slowly or have not recovered. One group that has recovered very quickly has been high wage earners or people who make a lot of money compared to low wage workers or people who have not been paid very much. They have not recovered as fast. One reason for this is that a lot of high wage jobs, you're able to actually do that job remotely. So you can do it from home, or at least you can do part of it from home. Compared to a lot of low wage jobs, it requires you to actually be there in person. The in person jobs have suffered a lot more during this recession compared to jobs where you're still able to do it from home. One example of this is, um, I'll, actually I'll get to the example in a second, but high wage compared to low wage. Let's look at some of the graphs and data. So this dark blue right here, are people who have make about uh, $32 an hour or more. This light blue or turquoise color are people who make between $20 and $32 an hour. This yellow one is people who make between $14 and $20 an hour. And this orange one right here are people who make less than $14 an hour. If we're looking at our y-axis, 
this is the percent change in number of jobs. So that's what these percents right here mean. And your y-axis is starting from, your x-axis is starting from January 2020 all the way through June 2020. So compared to January 2020, the lower wage jobs are still missing a lot of jobs. So let's take a step back. So this is January right here. Right here is about February. And here is our March. So during, let's go with, let's go. so during this period of time right here, in that February through March time, most jobs started slowly going down. And then in the March to April time, they went down by a lot. But if we're looking at the people who make a lot of money compared to the people who did not make that much money, by the people who make $32 and over, which basically means the people who make over about $64,000 per year, they have already, the number of those types of jobs have already started to go up. And by this point right here, which is about May, there was the same number of jobs that paid $32 an hour or more compared to January. So by May, that group of people had basically already recovered. Compared to the two groups down here, yes, in April, it hit sort of its lowest it was going to go. But if you look at now, compared to beginning of the year, your lowest wage jobs there are still between 16 and 20% fewer low wage jobs compared to the beginning of January. People who are in this category, they have not fully recovered their jobs yet. Here is a drawing of that K right there where your high wage workers have basically recovered while your low wage workers was still going down or very slow to recover. All right. So High wage workers have recovered more quickly. They're at the top part of the K. And low wage workers have recovered slower or not recovered. They're at the bottom part of that K recovery. If we're looking at industries, if we're looking at sections of the economy, um, there are some industries some types of jobs that have recovered very quickly. That includes technology, retail, retail is shopping, software services, software is stuff to do with computers, or particularly the programs on computers. Apps would also fall into this category. And finance, things to do with money. So this group right here has recovered very quickly. 
industries or sections of the economy, types of jobs that have not recovered or recovered very slowly include travel, entertainment, things that are fun, things to do with food, and this word right here, hospitality. Hospitality is jobs where you are entertaining people, where you bring people in, you entertain them, and then they leave. So for the entertainment industry, they have rehired about 74% of all the people who got let go. So if you look at the jobs that were lost in entertainment, 74% of them have come back. If you look at financial services, things to do with money, 94% uh, of those jobs have come back. And while 74% of the jobs coming back is, is, is you know, a big number, it, I'm glad it, that many of the jobs came back, but still 20% of these people, they lost their job and it's not coming back or has not come back. Let's look at this in graphs. So the red is these three industries, entertainment, travel, hospitality, and food. The blue is technology, retail, and software. This wa, uh, x-axis is time and the y-axis here I don't actually 100% know uh, I could not find that in that graph I can't I don't know whether this is amount of money in that industry or number of jobs but regardless technology retail and software has almost gotten back to where it was before um, compared to, it's almost back to where it was before, maybe a little bit lower, compared to these red industries have not recovered very well. Here was a different graph uh, saying about the same thing. This is change in how many people have jobs in those industries. Uh, professional and business services is basically back to where it started at the beginning of the year. This looks like it's down about 5%. So there are 5% less jobs by uh, the end of July compared to the beginning of January. Uh, education, healthcare, retail, um, and transportation. It looks like they, they, they mix retail and transportation here together. Um, that's down about 10%. Uh, I'll, I'll show you another slide in a second, but retail has actually recovered well. Transportation has not recovered well. It's mixed in here together though, um, so that's why it's at 10%. If retail was by itself and transportation was by itself, uh, retail would probably be higher than this, uh, have recovered more, transportation a lot less. Leisure and hospitality um, is still down almost 20% compared to January. Okay. All these jobs, what determines whether these jobs are coming back um, or the percent of these jobs that come back or how, how fast they come back is how much money people are spending on that type of thing. This word right here, consumer, are just people like you and me who buy things. So a consumer is somebody who buys things for their own use. You're either basically, the people who spend money are either uh, consumers or businesses or the government. So me and you, we are a consumer. So 
if you look at consumer spending and you look at how much that has changed compared to the beginning of the year, compared to January, uh, we're spending about 10% more in groceries. So that industry has basically recovered. But we're spending about 24, 25% less eating out and going to hotels. And like I said before in the previous slide, we're really spending a lot less on transportation. And so these industries down here, the restaurants, hotels, and transportation, that is one of those categories that has not really recovered. They are the bottom of that K-shaped recovery. Another group that has really had two different experiences in the recovery are renters compared to people who own assets. If we were to look at renters in 2019, 82% of renters were able to pay their rent on time in April. And this year, only 69% of people were able to pay their April rent on time. Now, 82, honestly, is not that even great of a number because it means that 18% of people were struggling to pay their rent. But it has gone up by a lot since then. It's gone up by 13%. And now we have about one out of every three renters are having a hard time or had a hard time paying their April rent. Uh, and so did, did not pay it on time. So if we were to compare that, um, well, let me show you the A chart. Uh, so this chart right here, uh, I don't want to talk about it that much, but the dark green line is 2019, the light green line is 2020, and your y-axis is the percent of people who have paid uh, their rent by these dates. So this is looking at starting at April 7th uh, through May 7th-ish. Now, as you go into the month, uh, more people pay their rent. That's what this, this going up line is more people are able to pay their rent. But the part I want to just point out is the difference between these two lines. Uh, that's the extra people who are struggling to pay their rent this year because of the recession compared to last year. Okay, so Renters are recovering much more slowly. They're at the bottom part of that K compared to people who own assets. And here, assets is anything of value, valuable stuff that you happen to own. And here, specifically, I'm talking about stocks. I'm talking about real estate. And if you look at stocks, this right here, the S&P 500, is the 500 most valuable companies here in the U.S. And the S&P 500 looks at those 500 companies combined, their, their stock prices, which is sort of a way of thinking about the value of those companies. So... This right here is the beginning of January. And right here, this is basically last Friday, the 25th. So the beginning of the year, the stock market was going up. And right here was February, 
where people decided, oh my gosh, there's this pandemic. The value of these companies dropped and dropped by quite a lot. This drop right here is equal to about 25%. So the value of the top 500 companies combined in the US went down by about 25% in one month. But the thing is, since then, since about the beginning of April, this has gone back up. And by about August or so, the S&P 500, those stocks, had recovered completely compared to January 1st. And actually now, the value of those companies are actually higher than at the beginning of the year, even though the pandemic is still going on. So, people who own stocks are part of that top part of the K. And who are those people? Well, 52% of all stocks are owned by the top 1% richest people uh, or top 1% wealthiest people. If you look at the top 10%, they own 84% of all the stocks. So the people who own stocks have done well in recovering. If we look at real estate, real estate is property, houses, uh, office buildings, things like that. So real estate is property. And if we were to look at the price of those properties here in the US, if you look at this, it looks like in 2019, for the second half of 2019, uh, the value of properties were staying about steady, not going up, not going down. Here is February. And during the first part of the recession, it wasn't really going anywhere, a little up, a little down, but not really going anywhere. But since May, even though the recession's still going on, the median price for property has actually been going up. And this is about up about eight to ten percent since just May through August. A reminder what this word here means, median. Median means that half the prices are higher, half the prices are lower. So right here, when they say in August 2020, the median price was about $330,000. Half the people who bought property bought for less than 330. Half the people bought for more than 330. But real estate basically never really went down and has actually gone up. So obviously the people who have a lot of their money in real estate, they are definitely part of the top part of that K and they have, they've recovered. Here is, once again, that price that I was talking about, about 330000 And that's actually 11% higher than September of last year. We are actually selling more houses now than September of last year. And those houses are sold. 34 were... 32% of those houses that are sold, the seller has actually been getting more money than they asked for, for the house. 
and 13% have been getting less money than they asked for. So this means that in general, the prices are still probably moving up. The reason these people are getting more money than they asked for is basically people are coming along and saying, oh, that person offered you 300000 but I want this house too. I'll give you 310000 And they've been bidding it up. All right. So people who own assets, they're part of that part of the case. People like renters are unfortunately part of the bottom part of the case. Let's look at just one more difference in who is part of that top part of the K, bottom part of the K. And let's look at actual businesses. Uh, large corporations in general have recovered very quickly compared to small businesses. If you look at large corporations, uh, AT&T, uh, Verizon, uh, Apple, Google, Ford, big companies. Part of the reason that they have been doing pretty well is because they have more resources to get through the pandemic. Resources here is things of value. They have more money in the bank or they're able to get more loans than a small business. So they're, even if they're losing money right now, they won't go out of business for a lot of these large corporations. Not all of them, some large corporations have gone out of business, but in general, large corporations will have more resources or can get more loans in order to survive until things get better. Compared to small businesses, there was a survey put out in May of 2020. And at that point, 58% of small businesses were worried that they would have to close permanently. If we were looking at, or I talked about before that whether or not a business reopens quickly and hires people again, or whether or not they reopen slowly, depends on people spending money in those industries. So if we were to look at consumer spending compared to January 1st, it went down here in March. This is when a lot of companies uh, and a lot of businesses closed. Uh, so there was not that many places to spend money and people had fewer jobs. So uh, the United States as a whole, we spent a lot less money. If you were looking at over here, April 1st, compared to March 1st, we were spending about 33% less money. Since then, the amount of money that we have spent has gone up. And right now, here in September, we're actually only spending about 4% less than we did at the beginning of the year. But that doesn't mean all businesses are getting 4% less now than they did at the beginning of the year. If we look at small businesses, this is the number of small businesses that are open right now. And we're looking at the percent change. So that's what the y-axis is. So if you're looking at the y-axis, 
that is percent change in how many small businesses are open. And here in March, it went down by a lot. And it looks like it continued to go down through the middle of April. Uh, and this is the time when a lot of states were closing businesses, closing um, restaurants, closing gyms, saying no one can go in. So, of course, that went down. But look at this. Here at the bottom here, that's probably almost 50% close to it, you know, 45%. So even though people started spending about 33% less money, um, 45% of small businesses were closed and getting no money coming in. So it seemed to have affected these small businesses a lot more. And even when the state said businesses can reopen again. It looks like small businesses open back up. But then right around here, right around in June, when the summer started, no, it kind of just plateaued and stopped going up. And right now, September 13th, compared to the beginning of the year, we still have about 24% less small businesses opened. And if you're looking at this section right here, where it just goes flat, it probably means a lot of these 24% are never going to reopen. So as you can see, uh, this is why a lot of people are saying that this is a K-shaped recovery because some groups have recovered, some groups either have not recovered or are recovering much slower. And it isn't that people fall a hundred percent into one group or a hundred percent in another group. If you happen to own stocks but work in hospitality, then your stocks have recovered, but maybe your job in hospitality has not. But the more groups up here you fall into, the better off you probably are now, the more you've recovered, and the more groups down here that you fall into, the less you've recovered. All right, you wonderful people, that is it for this. Uh, I hope you guys have a nice rest of your day, and I will see you in class tomorrow.